Hi, good morning, second grade. Happy Thursday. I hope everyone's having a fantastic day. Um, I wanted to go on and explain what you were doing today. So today you're going to continue to read The Boy Who Cried Wolf, narrated by the sheepest but truthful wolf, and you are going to read pages 14 through 19. Okay, so that means we're stopping right before the end of the book, which I know some of you guys are going to want to keep reading and figure out what happens at the end. So what I want you to do today is just read um, 14 through 19 and then tell me what happened in the story. That's in the middle part two. That's the assignment, okay? You're going to tell me what happened in the story and then what was one difference between this story and the story that we read on Monday about the boy who cried wolf. For writing today, I have posted three different videos on my YouTube about Miss um, Clifford reading you a fable. So there's three different ones, the pig in the, pan the um, candy store, the hippopotamus at dinner, and the baboon's umbrella. Okay, so those are three different stories. And I want you to read one of them or all of them and then tell me what the moral of that story was. Okay? All right. And then finish your eye reading minutes today, okay? You're supposed to have 45 of them. I think Dimitrik has like three hours. It's crazy, okay? Remember, you just need 45. So get your 45 minutes and then you are done. And make sure you have your 45 in math too, okay? All right. I am going to read to you today. I promised that I would. So I'm going to get a little comfy. We are going to start with the Magic Treehouse. And let's see. I don't remember what was going on. Let's go see if I can remember what page we are on. Um, oh, remember they were helping Priscilla with the Thanksgiving meal, right? And they said something very important and special was about to happen, so they had to go outside, right? So that is where we are going to start. Priscilla led Jack and Annie away from the village towards a large field, and the pilgrims and the Wamapeng men had already gathered there. Jack could hear the beat of a drum, but he couldn't see what was going on. Make haste, or we will miss it, said Priscilla. Miss what? asked Annie. Captain Standish is about to lead the men and boys. They will exercise their arms. Why do they exercise their arms? Jack wondered. Will they expect me to join in? As he hurried after Priscilla towards the crowd, Jack practiced. He stretched his arms out wide, he made circles in the air, and then he flapped his arms up and down. Priscilla caught sight of him. What are thou doing, Jack? Asked. She asked. Exercising my arms, he said. Priscilla smiled and she started to laugh. She laughed and she laughed. So did Jack, but he wasn't sure why. A loud bang came from the field. Jack jumped and stopped laughing. A puff of smoke rose in the air, and the crowd parted, and Jack saw the pilgrim men and boys proudly holding their long guns. What just happened? said Annie. The men fired their muskets, said Priscilla. On special occasions, they like to show off their arms. Oh, thought Jack. Now I get it. The long guns are muskets, which are also called arms, so exercising arms means firing muskets. Jack flushed. Priscilla must think that he's an idiot, he thought. But he just, she just smiled fondly. I thank, thee for, I thank thee for making me laugh, Jack, she said. I have not laughed hard in a long time. Jack shrugged as if he had meant to make her laugh. It's time now to serve our feast, said Priscilla. I must help with the bread. What can we do? asked Jack. Return to my home, take the turkey off the spit, put it on a platter, and bring it to the table. Oh, great. We'll get to help with the turkey, said Annie. I always help with the turkey at home. Good, said Priscilla. May thou feel my home as thy home today. Jack was excited too. He and Annie were about to serve the first turkey at the first Thanksgiving. They ran back to the smoky house and rushed inside. Where's the platter, said Jack, looking around. He saw a flat wooden block. That must be it. Annie picked up the wooden platter. How do we get the turkey on it, she asked. They moved close to the fire and stared at the turkey roasting on the iron rod. That must be the spit, said Jack. The spit sat on iron legs and had a handle. Jack pushed his glasses into place. I'll lift the spit and then we'll push the turkey into the platter. Be careful, said Annie. Jack reached out and he wrapped his fingers around the iron spit. Ow, he shouted. The handle was super hot. He yanked his hand away and he knocked the spit off its legs. The turkey fell into the fire. The grease from the turkey sputtered and popped and the turkey burst into flames. The fire roared. Ah, yelped Jack and Annie together. They jumped back from the hearth. Jack grabbed the watering pot on the floor and he threw the water into the fire. The fire sizzled, smoke bellowed, and the smoke cleared. The fire was out. 
but the turkey was completely black. So you can see things are not going well. They always seem to get themselves in these situations, right? Oh my goodness. Jack buried his face in his hands. I don't believe it, he said. I just burned up the pill. Oh, that's it. Sorry. That is it for the chapter. I just started reading the next one. All right. We're going to have to read what happens. Hopefully he didn't ruin the whole Thanksgiving, right? I'm sure they'll find a way to fix it. All right. I am going to switch over to Charlotte's Web. All right. We're just going to read a little bit of Charlotte's Web. We're not going to read the whole chapter. This is a long chapter, okay? Charlotte's Web. Ready? The next morning, when the first light came into the sky and the sparrows stirred in the trees, when the cows rattled their chains and the rooster crowed and the early automobiles went whispering along the road, Wilbur awoke and looked for Charlotte. He saw her overhead in a corner near the back of his pen. She was very quiet. Her eight legs were spread wide. She seemed to have shrunk during the night. Next to her, attached to the ceiling, Wilbur saw a curious object. It was sort of a sack or a cocoon. It was peach colored and it looked as though it was made of cotton candy. Are you awake, Charlotte? He said softly. Yes, came an answer. What's that nifty little thing? Did you make it? I did indeed, replied Charlotte in a weak voice. Is it a plaything? Plaything? I should say not. It is my egg sack. My magnum opus. I don't know what a magnum opus is, said Wilbur. That's Latin, explained Charlotte. It means great work. This egg sack is my great work, the finest thing I've ever made. What's inside of it? asked Wilbur. Eggs? Five hundred and fourteen of them, she replied. Five hundred and fourteen, said Wilbur. You're kidding. Here's a little picture of the egg sack in Charlotte. No, I'm not. I counted them. I got started counting, so I just kept on, just to keep my mind occupied. It's a perfectly beautiful egg sack said Wilbur, feeling as happy as though he had constructed it himself. Yes, it is pretty, replied Charlotte, patting the sack with her two front legs. Anyway, I can guarantee that it is strong. It's made out of the toughest material I have. It's also waterproof. The eggs are inside and will be warm and dry. Charlotte, said Wilbur, are you ready to have 514 children? Well, if nothing happens, she said, yes, of course. They won't show up till next spring. Wilbur noticed that Charlotte's voice sounded sad. What makes you sound so downhearted? I would think you'd be terribly happy about this. Oh, don't pay any attention to me, said Charlotte. I just don't have much pep anymore. I guess I feel sad because I won't ever see my children. What do you mean you won't see your children? Of course you will. We'll all see them. It's going to be simply wonderful next spring in the barn cellar with all 514 baby spiders running around all over the place, and the geese will have a new set of goslings, and the sheep will have their new lambs. Maybe, said Charlotte quietly. However, I have a feeling I'm not going to see the results of last night's effort. I don't feel good at all. I think I'm languishing, to tell you the truth. Wilbur didn't understand what the word languish means, and he hated to bother Charlotte by asking her to explain, but he was worried, so he felt like he needed to ask. What did languishing mean? It means I'm slowing up. Feeling my age. I'm not young anymore, Wilbur, but I don't want you to worry about me. This is your big day. Look at my web. Doesn't it show well with the new dew on it? Charlotte's web never looked more beautiful than it looked this morning. Each strand held dozens of bright drops of early morning dew. The light from the east struck it and made it pl all plain and clear. It was a perfect piece of designing and building. In another hour or two, a steady stream of people would pass by admiring it reading it and looking at Wilbur and marveling at the miracle. As Wilbur was studying the web, a pair of whiskers and sharp faces appeared. Slowly, Templeton dragged himself across the pen, threw himself down in the corner. I'm back, he said in a husky voice. What a night. The rat was swollen to twice his normal size, and his stomach was as big as a jar of jelly. What a night, he repeated hoarsely. What a feasting and carousaling and a real gorge. I must have eaten the remains of 30 lunches. Never have I seen such leavings and everything well ripened and seasoned with the passing of time and the heat of the day. Oh, it was rich, my friends, rich. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Charlotte in disgust. It would serve you right if you had an acute attack of indigestion. 
Don't worry about my stomach, snarled Templeton. It can handle anything. And by the way, I've got some bad news. As I came past the pig next door, the one that calls himself Uncle, I noticed a blue tag on the front of his pen. That means he's won first prize. I guess you're licked, Wilbur. You might as well relax. Nobody's going to hang a medal on you. Furthermore, I wouldn't be surprised if Suckerman changes his mind about you. Wait till he gets a hankering for some fresh pork and some smoked ham and crispy bacon. He'll take a knife to you, my boy. Be still, Templeton, said Charlotte. You're too stuffed and bloated to know what you're saying. Don't pay any attention to him, Wilbur. Wilbur tried not to think about what the rat had said. He decided to change the subject. Templeton, said Wilbur, if you weren't so dopey, you wouldn't have noticed that Charlotte has made an egg sack and she's going to become a mother. For your information, there's 514 eggs in that peachy little sack. Is this true? He said, said the rat, eyeing the sack suspiciously. Yes, it's true, said Charlotte. Congratulations, murmured Templeton. This has been a night. He closed his eyes, pulled up some straw over himself, and dropped into a deep sleep. Wilbur and Charlotte were glad to be rid of him for a while, at least. All right. And that is where we are going to stop with Charlotte's Web today. And we will read the rest of it maybe tomorrow. Okay. All right. I hope everyone gets their work in and you guys enjoy listening to Miss Clifford read you guys some fables. All right. Bye, everyone.